Man, the title of my sermon this morning is Going Back to the Greek Fraud. Going Back to the Greek Fraud. This morning I'm going to tell you about one of the biggest scams, one of the greatest frauds in the history of Christianity. And that is this idea that if we go back to the Greek, we're going to find all these hidden meanings and secret teachings or nuances that we can't translate into English. You know, we can't really get them in any language because Greek is just so much deeper, as if it's some kind of a special, mystical, magical language. So one of our church members, Brother Peter here, uh, and myself, and a Reformed Baptist pastor from Gilbert, the three of us actually just got back last night from Cyprus, which is a Greek-speaking island, and we went there to prove a simple point that Greek is just like any other normal human language that people speak on this planet. And not only that, but we wanted to demonstrate that modern-day Greek speakers can read the Greek New Testament without an issue, without a problem. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, because of the fact that we've been told all our lives by thousands and thousands of Bible colleges and seminaries all across America that modern Greek is a completely different language from biblical Greek and that they can't understand each other and so forth. And, um, but we went over there and we talked to teenagers. We even talked to foreigners who had learned Greek as a second language. But, you know, they were fluent in it because they lived there. And, I mean, we talked to a guy who ran a tattoo parlor. And he had no problem, even though he'd never looked at it before in his life, he had no problem reading the Greek New Testament with us. Pulled out the original Greek, 2,000 years old, showed it to him, and he read it, and he understood it without an issue. In fact, we were able to win 25 people to the Lord while we were there. And out of these 25 people to the Lord that we won, 23 of them we did with just a Greek New Testament. That was the only Bible we used. The original Greek underlying the King James, the Textus Receptus. That's what we used as the Bible to give them the Word of God, to give them the salvation verses and explain to them the gospel. And then two of them we got saved with the King James because they were people that were uh, foreigners who did not speak Greek. Now, before this trip, my theory was that, the, and, and you know, I'd studied both modern Greek and biblical Greek. Before this trip, my theory was that the difference between modern Greek and the Bible's Greek is about like the difference between the way we talk today and the King James Bible. Now think about this. The King James Bible is not the way that we talk today, is it? But yet, fluent English speakers understand it without an issue, don't they? So for example, let's take the word serpent. Everybody knows what a serpent is, right? But yet, we would never be out hiking or something and say, behold, a serpent is in the path. You know, 100% of people would call that animal what? What would they call that? They'd call that animal a snake. They would never even think to use the word serpent, but yet they know what it is. I remember when I was a kid, I used to play this video game on the original Nintendo. It's called Dragon Warrior. Who knows what I'm talking about? The original 8-bit Nintendo Dragon Warrior. And when you died, it would say, thou hast died. <laughs> and it would actually, all of the English in this video game was in King James type English. And of course, when you're in high school, you read Shakespeare and stuff like that. And so we're able to understand it. Obviously, it's not how we talk, but is the King James written in a completely foreign language? Absolutely not. So whenever any crime is committed, whenever any fraud is perpetrated, whenever any sin is sinned, there's always a motive, right? I mean, if you were to go into the criminal justice system, that's a big deal. They say, hey, we need a motive or we can't convict this guy, right? Because everything that people do is for a motive. So if this giant scam, this giant fraud exists, this great big lie that's being told every day in thousands of Bible colleges and seminaries that New Testament Greek and modern Greek are two totally different languages, they can't understand each other, they're not mutually intelligible, then we have to ask ourselves the big question, why? Why? What's the motive for this fraud, this scam, this lie that's being told? It's clearly a lie. And you know what? You'll never convince me it's not a lie because I just got back last night right. from being there and walking up and down the street 
and literally opening my New Testament to approximately a hundred people. You know, between all of us, we probably opened that New Testament to a hundred people and they did not even bat an eye. They didn't even raise an eyebrow. I said, hey, are you having any trouble understanding this? No. Nope. So what does this mean? And then they would tell you exactly what it meant. It's a lie, folks. It's a fraud. Thousands of Bible colleges and seminaries are complicit in this. Why? Reason number one, I'm going to give you three reasons for this great fraud. Reason number one is to hide the fact that they don't actually know Greek. Because now no one could call them on the carpet. I mean, if I started proclaiming myself an expert in Spanish and started saying, well, if you go back to the Spanish, here's what the Bible really means, and made up all this goofy stuff that's not true, then wouldn't Spanish speakers all over the world be calling me out? 400 million Spanish speakers would call me out. Well, there are 13 million people over in Greece and other Greek-speaking countries that would be calling them out, but they say, oh, no, that's a totally different language. So now no one can point out the fact that they actually don't know the language at all, and they're making things up. Now, let me prove this to you, but first, look at Hebrews chapter 5, where you are there. Hebrews chapter number 5, verse 11. It says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we see here that for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have no need that one teach you again. So there are people in this world who get up and teach something and they don't even know it themselves, right? How do we actually get to know things? Well, the Bible here says that the way that we actually can learn the strong meat of the word is by using the word. So who's on the milk? It's the guy who's not using the word of God. And then those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern good and evil, they're the ones who can get on the strong meat of the word. So you've got to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Go to James chapter 1. Just a few pages to the right in your Bible. James chapter 1, the Bible says there's the milk and there's the meat, and the ones that are on the meat are the ones who are using the word of God. Now, it's like this with any subject, right? Let's say electrical. Do we have any electricians out there today? Put up your hand if you're an electrician. Right. Now, you can learn a lot about electrical in the classroom, right? But isn't there another aspect of getting out there and doing some electrical work? I mean, what if you went into a classroom and learned all about how to play basketball? And you have a guy in front of a chalkboard and he's explaining to you how to shoot the ball, how to dribble, what the rules are, how to make a bounce pass. But then there's actually getting out and playing basketball, isn't there? Yeah. Are those the same thing? No. I mean, you could read all about martial arts and self-defense, but until you get out there and start throwing some punches and taking some punches, you're not a fighter, are you? I mean, you have to actually use what you've learned. Well, it's the same thing with the Word of God. You can sit and read and study and read and study and read and study, but in order to grasp the wisdom of God, you have to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. Okay? Now look down at your Bible there in James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, But be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So when it says he beholds his natural face in a glass, it's talking about like looking at his physical face in the mirror, right? So it's like he looks at his face in the mirror, and straightway or immediately forgets what manner of man he was. He forgets what he looked like. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, verse 25, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So there are two types of people who study the word of God. There are those who are forgetful hearers, and there are those who are doers of the work. You know, the implication there is that if you do the work, you're going to retain what you've learned. 
I mean, what do people always say about things that they learned in high school that they've forgotten? If they learned algebra and they forgot it, why did they forget algebra? Because they don't use algebra. So yeah, they learned some algebra in school, but are they proficient in algebra today? No. Are they proficient in calculus today? No, not unless they use it. The things that we use are the things that we know how to do. We're advanced, we're skillful in the things that we do. The things that we don't do, we don't know. Well, it's the same thing with a foreign language. You've heard the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So, you know, there, there have been languages that I studied and I used to use and speak that I've almost completely forgotten. You know, 20 years ago, I learned how to speak Romanian, and I used to be able to sit and have conversations, long conversations with Romanians and be able to speak Romanian. I read the New Testament twice in Romanian. But today, I know very little. We, we had a layover on our way to Cyprus where we stopped in Romania, and I was able to order some food and order a drink and, and you know, joke around a little bit in Romanian. But, you know, when the announcements were going and everything, a lot of it was just going right over my head because I haven't been using it in like 20 years, so I pretty much completely have forgotten that language. Well, here's the thing. You learn a language by speaking a language. You don't learn a foreign language by sitting in a classroom and learning a bunch of grammar rules and sentences are being diagrammed. And, you know, you have to actually speak. You have to open your mouth and use that language, which is why, by the way, modern language software and modern day language classes focus on this. So if you were to download, say, a Rosetta Stone or something like that, you have to actually talk into the microphone and go back and forth. Or with Pimsleur, you talk back and forth with the recording because they know that you have to actually talk and use the language in order to learn. That's the way our brains were wired. How did you learn how to speak English? Did you learn how to speak English? Your mom just sat you down one day and said, all right, let me explain to you what a verb is. Let me explain to you what a noun is. Let me explain to you a preposition. Or did you just start talking? And first you did it wrong and you stumbled through it and then you got good at it and now you speak it without an issue. And if you open a book and read it, do you sit there and analyze every word and break it down and diagram every sentence or do you just read? You just open the book and read, right? Well, guess what? Greek's the same way because it's just a language that people speak and hear and read. Now, what would you tell me if I told you, let's just use Spanish for an example. What if I said, well, I know Spanish. In fact, I teach Spanish for a living, but I can't speak Spanish. If I listen to something in Spanish, I can't understand it verbally. I can read Spanish, but I can only read two books in Spanish. And when I read those two books in Spanish, I have to use a dictionary and a lexicon, and I have to look things up. Do you, does it sound like I'm qualified to teach Spanish, if that's me? It's absurd. You'd say, that's ridiculous. That's insane. If you're going to be a Spanish teacher, you should be able to pick up any number of Spanish books and read them. And you should be able to speak Spanish and understand Spanish. So there are three aspects to this, speaking, listening, and reading. And you should be able to do all three if you're going to claim to be a Spanish speaker or claim to be a Spanish teacher or a Spanish expert. I know this is common sense, folks, but when we travel over into the land of Bible college and Bible seminary, you can not know how to speak Greek, not know how to read anything in Greek except the Bible, and even then you have to look things up, and not be able to listen audibly to the Greek language and understand it, but supposedly you're a Greek expert, you're a Greek teacher, you're qualified now to write books on the Greek, and most importantly, you're able to now correct the King James and tell us how the King James is wrong, and here's what the Bible really says. Folks, the King James Bible was translated by 54 top scholars over the course of six years who were all fluent, fluent, fluent in Greek. They could pick up anything from the Iliad and the Odyssey to Sophocles to Plato, and they could read it without an issue, and they could walk up to a Greek person living in their day and talk to that Greek person. That's the kind of man who translated the King James Bible. The people who today are telling us that the King James is wrong, that we need to go back to the Greek, we're losing so much in the translation, they don't even know the language, folks. Why? Because they don't use it. They never speak Greek. All they do is parse verbs, diagram sentences, chop it up, use a microscope to analyze it, but they don't actually use the language to preach or go soul winning or for, even for their daily devotions. They don't, they don't wake up in the morning and read the Bible in Greek. 
because they don't know the language, okay? Let me prove this to you, okay, since some people might be skeptical, and I don't blame you because it's so bizarre. I don't blame you if you find all this hard to believe. Here is a blog post written by Daniel R. Street, Ph.D. So if you won't listen to me, listen to him, all right? So Daniel R. Street, Ph.D., is associate professor at Houston Baptist University, wrote this article. Greek professors, do they know Greek? <laughs> in November 2008, here's his blog post. In November 2008, I presented a paper at the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society on teaching Greek communicatively. As an experiment, I began my presentation by passing out a quiz for attendees to take. I'm guessing it was the first time that that had ever happened. Attendance was pretty good, about 30 audience members. Here's the quiz, see how you can do. So he gives this quiz to the people at this theological society meeting. All they have to do is write the Greek for this English. You want, I'm gonna give you the 10 questions on the quiz. Number one, yes. <laughs> Number two, chair or seat. Number three, ball. Number four, cat. Number five, monkey. Number nine, the number nine. Or number six, sorry. Did you, were you, somebody correct me? Six is nine. Okay, number seven, red. Cold is number eight. Nose is number nine. And to jump is number 10. And then for the bonus points, hello, how are you, goodbye. Does this sound like a pretty hard quiz? <laughs> Again, this is yes, chair, ball, cat, monkey, nine, red, cold, nose, jump, hello, how are you, bye. Who thinks they could do pretty well on that in Spanish? Okay, now, okay, you got your hand, oh, so you're, you're ready to, you're an expert, grandmaster, wizard in Spanish, right? <laughs> no, because this is something that you would all learn in Spanish one. Right. Right. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, let's see how these guys did. I'm going to continue with the blog post. My audience was made up of mostly Greek professors and doctoral level students who had probably taken on average four to seven years of Greek by now, and some of whom had been teaching Greek for 20 to 30 years by now. After the audience had finished, I collected their quizzes. The average grade was 0.4 out of 10. The average grade was 0.4 out of 10. Most testees could not answer any of the questions correctly, although they tried. The highest grade was 2 out of 10. Wow. Now, this audience included many scholars who had written best-selling Greek textbooks and grammars, and of course, I won't name their names. I would have, but he, that's what he said. <laughs> Folks, did you hear that? By the way, I took the same test, and I'm not bragging here because it's such an easy, ridiculously easy test. I took the same test, I got nine out of 10 right, and I got the bonus. I just didn't know the word for jump, but I learned it since then. So, listen to this. Greek professors admit they don't know Greek. Let me relate to you, this is the same blog post, the nearly universal response that I received from Greek professors when I advocate for a communicative method. Many are very receptive to, even enthusiastic about the possibilities in such a method, but without exception, I hear from them, I simply don't know Greek well enough to teach it this way. I could never carry on a whole class in Greek, and so on. Give these professors a little credit. At least they're being honest and open about the problem. Not really, because should they be teaching Greek for a living if they don't know the language? At least they're being honest and open about the problem. We Greek professors can parse till the cows come home. We're experts at filling out paradigm charts. We love to explain the historical role of the digamma in irregular verbs. We can nerd out and on and on about proclitics and enclitics, but what we lack is simple proficiency in Greek. This is written by a Greek professor, a PhD at a Baptist university, gave a seminar to 30 guys who are supposedly getting doctorates in Greek, and they could not even answer more than two questions right. The average score was 0 0.4 on this quiz. So, folks, this is what we're dealing with, okay? These guys don't know Greek, but they're ready to tell you how wrong your King James Bible is. Folks, they're a bunch of liars and frauds is what they are. It's a joke. It's ridiculous. How do they get away with this? 
Because here's what they do. They use this goofball pronunciation in order to convince people that it's a totally different language. They use this made up goofball Erasmian pronunciation where they guess, here's what we think it sounded like in 500 BC. And they have this totally different pronunciation. So then that's why they explain why they can't communicate with a Greek speaker. Well, that's funny because what does the pronunciation have to do with you not being able to fill out a 10 question quiz? There's no pronunciation required for that. But this is what they hide behind when you walk up to them and start speaking Greek to them. Oh, that's a different pronunciation. Well, I got news for you. The Bible is written in the first century AD. So why would you use a pronunciation from 500 BC? And even if the Bible were, even if the New Testament were written in 500 BC, why would you use some ancient made up pronunciation when there's no tape recording of what it sounded like back then? How do you know what it sounded like back then? No one knows what it sounded like. But you know what we do know? How 13.4 million people speak Greek right now. And if you use that pronunciation, you'd be able to communicate with Greek people. If you actually were fluent in the Bible's language, you could communicate with Greek people no problem, but they're not, so that's why they lie and hide behind it being a different language, okay? That's the, the first reason that they lie about it. Number two reason that they lie about it is because they want you to think that Greek is a special language so that they can pull out all these hidden esoteric meanings that you can't get from reading it in English. And let me just make this crystal clear from the get-go. You do not need to learn Greek to understand the Bible. There's no need for you to learn Greek to understand the Bible. You can be born and live and die and live a wonderful Christian life and understand all the doctrine and win souls to Christ and earn rewards in heaven without learning a single word in Greek because you have an accurate translation into English in the King James Bible. And you know what it says when you read it in Greek? The same thing it says in English. There's no difference when you go and read it in Greek. The English Bible has everything that you need to serve God and preach and read your Bible and be edified. There's no difference, folks. It's not like Greek is some magical special language. You know why God gave us the New Testament in Greek? is because that was the biggest language in the world at that time. That was the main lingua franca of Europe. What's the biggest language right now? English. English. Two billion speakers. Okay, if you count people who are learning it as a second language. Nowadays, when you go to Europe, all the young people speak English. It's amazing how English is just spreading like wildfire. God knew that English was going to be the most significant, most important language. So, so through his providence, he worked it out where we could get a perfect Bible in English where he got all these experts that came together and put six years of effort into it. And by the way, they already had a great Bible in English before that. In fact, it was literally called the Great Bible. That was the name of it. They already had the Great Bible. They already had the Bishop's Bible. And you know what? Those Bibles were great. And then they spent six years just dialing it in and getting it perfect. Folks, what a treasure that we have. Thank God that we are English speakers and that we have the King James Version because there are some people in other strange uh, languages and, and parts of the world where they don't have the Word of God in their language, the whole book. They might have only the New Testament. Right. Or they might have a poor quality translation done by one person or three people. We have one done by 54 bona fide experts. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Did you read it? Did you read it this week or are you just, it's just enshrined on a shelf somewhere? Because let me tell you something, you've got to use it. Amen. Use it or lose it, amen? amen? Read it, study it, love it, share the gospel from it. That's how you'll learn the Bible, by using the word of God. Be a doer of the work. By the way, in that same scripture, are you still there in James 1? It says, if any man among you seem to be religious, verse 26, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to lock yourself up in a library and study the Word of God and parse verbs and diagram sentences and go back to the Greek. And... No, it's to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Do you see how to God, religion should be a practical thing where we actually get out and do work not just hearing, hearing, learning, learning, 
but actually going out and doing stuff with the Word of God, right? Something that actually has practical significance for our lives. Folks, it was so great on this trip to be able to go out and take a Greek New Testament and win someone to Christ with it. And you know what? That Greek New Testament is being studied in thousands of Bible colleges, thousands of seminaries, and students are spending hundreds and hundreds of hours in these Greek classes. Professors are spending hundreds and hundreds of hours. You know, when was the last time one of them actually went to Greece or went to Crete or went to Cyprus and actually won somebody to Christ? Did they ever use it? Do they even care that there are 13.4 million people, most of whom are on their way to hell because they're part of the Orthodox Church, which is a false religion? Right. Right. You know, we won 23 Greeks to the Lord on this trip, and every single one of them was Orthodox, and every single one of them did not know they were going to heaven. Many of them said, well, I'm going to hell. Folks, the Greek Orthodox Church teaches a works-based salvation. Yeah. It's total work salvation. You say, well, I don't know that much about the Orthodox religion. Do you know about Roman Catholicism? Well, guess what? It's not that different. It's not that different because they both are just steeped in tradition. They both got the priests, you know, wearing the long dresses and telling you that, you know, you have to go to church and do all the works so and you confess to them and do all these things in order to be saved. It's not salvation by faith alone. It's not even close to that. So who's going to get all these people saved? You say, well, I don't think Europe's receptive. Really? Then how come we just got like 25 people saved in the last week and a half? Now, it's true that many of the older crowd were not receptive. In fact, every single person that we won to Christ was between the ages of 15 and 25. Wow. That was the demographic. And you know what that tells me is that there's a new generation that God is raising up today in Greece where God is raising up a new generation where they're sick of the Orthodox Church, they're seeing through it, they're hungry for the gospel, they're hungry for the word of God. They were genuinely interested when we went to that demographic of 15 to 25. They wanted to hear it. They had questions. We had the answers. We were able to flip open a Greek New Testament and use it today. Amen. Instead of just, oh, well, you know, we're studying it in the seminary and, you know, the King James didn't really render this very accurately. <laughs> how do you know? You don't even know how to say cat and dog. <laughs> you don't even know how to say hi, how are you? You literally couldn't even order a glass of water at one of these restaurants. And in fact, the other pastor that was on the trip with us, you know, he posted something to some of his friends and some of his community saying, look, you know, modern Greek professors today in Bible colleges and seminaries, couldn't even order a glass of water. And here's what they said. Well, why would we ever want to order a glass of water? Wow. Well, you know what? If you actually understood the Bible, you'd remember the part where Jesus ordered a glass of water when he walked up to the woman at the well and said, give me the drink. Right. <laughs> or what about the scripture where he said that if you give a cup of cold water unto one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, you won't lose your reward. Hey, sounds like if you actually knew the Greek New Testament, you'd know how to say those things. Right. Am I right? Amen. Is that not mentioned in the Bible? Isn't there food and drink and different things? Well, I'm not interested in speaking to Greek people. You know, I'm just interested in just reading the Bible in Greek. No, you're not. You're interested in being a charlatan and a fraud and sounding smart and impressing people. And number one, basically, you don't want people to find out that you don't actually know Greek because you're trying to look so smart. And then number two reason why you're lying about it is because you want people to think it's some special, mystical, magical language like Klingon or something that only you know. And you know what? These Bible colleges and seminaries, they might as well be like a Star Trek convention where they just all geek out and speak Klingon. Some fake language that nobody speaks. There's no country in the world that speaks it. And they're just like, you know, talking about going back to the Greek and everything. It's stupid. Guess what? There's 13.4 million Klingons that need the gospel. Amen? I'm joking, of course. Greek's not Klingon. Greek's a real language with real people. So they want you to think it's all special. Now, let me give you an example of this, okay? So there, go to John 19, John chapter 19. I'll give you an example in John chapter 19.
Well, we don't need to order a glass of water. We don't need to talk to Greek people. Well, you know what? Shame on you, because if you're going to invest thousands of hours studying a foreign language, wouldn't you want to get those people saved, especially when you find out how receptive they are to the gospel and how the 15 to 25 demographic is just ready to hear the gospel? Well, I'm not interested in that. Okay, well, then you just stay here, Dr. Fatbottom, in your high steeple, few people church, and stay in your Bible college, in your seminary, and parse, and diagram, and study. And you know what? I wonder how many rewards at the judgment seat of Christ are going to be given. And the, the guy who studied Greek the most is. <laughs> Do you think you're going to get a reward for learning Greek? Do you think you're going to get a reward, even in English, just for knowing the most Bible? You think it's like a, a sword drill up there, a, a spelling bee, and you're going to get all these rewards because you learn stuff? Folks, you get rewards according to your work. He said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Okay. At your job, you that are electricians, I relate to that because I was an electrician formerly. You don't get a paycheck or a pay raise based on your knowledge of Ohm's law, do you? Oh, you, you, whoa, you know the theory so well. Here's your, your, your pay raise. No, you get a raise because you wired up the building, and when they flipped the switch, nothing blew up. <laughs> nothing exploded. And you know what? We've all flipped that switch and had a little explosion happen, right? Who's flipped the switch, and there was a little pop, and something blew up? Okay, hey, you get a raise for, going, for getting the job done, for making it look good, your conduit looks straight, your bends are an art form when you bend that conduit, and when you turn it on, it doesn't explode. That's what they want. Well, that's what God wants too. You know, he wants you to go out and actually do something for the Lord. He wants you to love him and love your neighbor, not just loving yourself, okay, and, and puffing yourself up with knowledge. So here's an example, and, and I look, I could go on all morning with examples of this. I'm just going to give you one example. I've heard this one many times, and, and I know other people have probably heard this. But in John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, that phrase, it is finished, I've heard preachers get up and spend like 15 to 20 minutes on that phrase. Telling you, if you go back to the Greek, I mean, it just packs so much more meaning. Now, here's the thing. This word in Greek just means it's finished. It's done. It's just the most basic way of saying it is done. It's finished. Now, if I wanted to understand what this meant in the Bible, because some people have asked me this question, what did Jesus mean when he said it is finished? And, and there is debate about what he meant by that. Well, what I would do is I would just look up the other three times that the word finish is used in the book of John. Right? There are three other times in, in the book of John where the Bible talks about something being finished. Like, for example, John 4.34 says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then in John 5.36, Jesus said, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So what do you see about all three of these instances? They all have to do with Jesus saying, you know what? I finished the work. My meat is to finish his work. I'm going to finish God's work. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He gets up on the cross and right before he dies, he says, it's finished. Hmm, I wonder what was finished. Three times he predicted this. He's finishing the work. Amen? Amen. So I've heard these sermons where they say, well, if you go back to the Greek, the word is tetelesta. Now, I'm actually pronouncing it right. I've heard all kinds of pronunciations. Just all over. I've heard everything from tetelestai to just the, all kinds of crazy stuff. But, the, the, you know, the actual pronunciation is tetelesta. Okay? I've heard these guys go on for 15 to 20 minutes and say, you know, we, you know when we hear that in English, we just think it's finished. But boy, this word, tetelesta, you know, uh, let me give you some examples of this word's use. You know, for example, someone's creating a masterpiece painting. They put the final brush stroke. They would stand back and say, tetelesta. <laughs> you know, uh, so there's, a bit, there's a huge debt that's being paid for 60 months. You're sending in that payment month after month after month. And finally, when the debt is paid and the car is totally paid off, that receipt is stamped. Tetelestat. 
paid in full. And I mean, they just went on and on with all these wild examples of just all the different ways. You know, a servant goes and he, he works his six years. And when the six years of labor are over, his boss just looks at him and says, to tell us that, you know, and they, they just make this huge deal. So basically, like when a Greek person hears this word, it's finished. When they hear to tell us that, it's just like all of a sudden their brain's just like downloading all these images. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like a painting's being finished. A realtor sells a house. They sign a contract. Someone's getting married. A baby's being born. Folks, it just means that it's finished. But they want you to think, oh, man, there's just so much more meaning packed into that Greek word. There's no evidence for any of this, of course. Basically, they just make a list of things that could be finished. You know, someone gets a haircut and the last hair is snipped to tell us that. Someone eats a cheeseburger and they put the last bite in their mouth to tell us that. You know, it's just like they're basically just making a list of things that you could theoretically finish and say, oh, it's all packed into that word. Well, by that standard, that's all packed in the English word then. Anything that you could ever finish in your whole life. You know, you graduate from college and walk across with your cap and gown. To tell us that! <laughs> Folks, it just means that it's finished. You know, when, when the, whatever word, horse, cow, run, walk, eat, drink, it means this. It's, it's, folks, it's just a language. But they want you to think it's some weird, mystical, kind of, you know, esoteric meaning there. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. It's totally unnecessary to go back to the Greek when you have an excellent English translation in the King James Bible. It's finished. Tetelesta, right? It's done. Oh, we got we to translate the Bible into English. It already happened in 1611. It's done. It's finished. Read, now we need to re, be rereading. Instead of rewriting the Bible, let's reread the Bible. Amen? It's totally unnecessary to go back to the Greek. They're going back to the Greek in order to make themselves look smart. That's the true story, okay? Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 3. But he that prophesieth, prophesieth is another word for preaching, prophesying, preaching. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. Edification means to build you up. Exhortation and comfort. He's either trying to edify you, exhort you, comfort you. He's trying to build you up, teach you something, rebuke something, right? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So what's my job when I get up here behind the pulpit? Am I trying to edify you or am I trying to edify myself? I should be trying to edify you and saying, here, let me take uh, things in the Bible and make them understandable for you. Let me explain them to you. Let me make them relevant to today and expound God's word to you. Not just so it's a theory, so you can actually use it. You know, if I preach a marriage sermon, it's so you can have a good marriage. If I preach a child rearing sermon, it's so you can rear your children. If I preach a soul winning sermon, it's so you can get out and go soul winning. If I preach a sermon against sin, it's so that you can do the practical action of getting the sin out of your life. This isn't just some academic exercise up here of, look how smart I am. If you go back to the Greek, here's what it says. Oh, wow. It's garbage, folks. I would that you all spake with tongues. Speaking with tongues, being in a foreign language. Tongues, languages, those words are synonymous. But rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. He said, look, a guy could know a whole bunch of foreign languages, but I'd rather have the guy just preach to me in my own language so I could actually learn something. I'd rather have an English speaker get up and preach to me in English because I speak English than to have somebody speak 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Oh, he knows Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Well, so what if he's not preaching anything worth listening to? Then who cares? He said, I would that you all speak. Hey, look, if I could push a button and everybody in this room would just instantly be fluent in New Testament Greek, I would push that button. You know, I would that you all speak. But, but, but you know what? It's not going to happen, folks. Most people aren't cut out for learning a foreign language. 
Most people don't have the time and energy to learn a foreign language. And if they did have the time and energy to learn a foreign language, they'd probably choose Spanish because it's going to be more useful to them in Phoenix, Arizona. Right. Right. What do you think is going to win more souls to Christ, learning Greek or Spanish, Spanish, realistically, where you live? But if I thought that we had to know Greek to understand the Bible, I'd be saying, hey, we all need to learn Greek, folks, right? Because we've got to know this. You know, we've got to figure out what the Bible really says. Folks, it's all right there in English. Learn Spanish so you can get people to say And I'm not against you learning Greek. And look, if there's anybody in here that wants to actually learn Greek, I think that's great, but you have to actually learn it and don't be a liar and a fraud and a charlatan pretending that you know it when you don't even know Jack. Okay? And if you learn it, don't learn it so that you can edify yourself and show off and be puffed up. Learn it so that you can actually be edified in your closet reading your Bible alone, not grandstanding. Or learn it so that you can actually go out and preach to lost Greek people. Because that's a great way to use it as well. Hey, I, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. I'd rather that you were preaching. I'd rather that you were soul winning. I'd rather that you're just using the word of God in your language than to learn foreign languages. It's more important the work that you're doing than what language you're doing it in. Amen? But what shall I profit you, in verse 6, except I shall... Speak to you by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, watch this, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. Folks, if I got up and just use a bunch of big, fancy theological jargon and you don't understand what that means, then what does it profit? I'm speaking into the air at that point. Now, I'd make, I'd make myself look smart, and that's what a lot of these guys are doing. They get up and use a lot of big, fancy theological terms. They go back to the Greek a little bit, go back to the Hebrew a little bit. Neither language do they actually speak. Folks, if the Greek professors don't even speak it, how much less do you think the pastors who went to their class speak it. The disciple's not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. If the professors don't even know Greek, how much less do these pastors who get up and go back to the Greek know? They don't know it. They cannot speak Greek. In fact, I've confronted these guys repeatedly. I just walk up to them and say the most basic phrases to them in Greek, and this is what they told me. They said, well, nobody's fluent in it. Because I said, well, you're not fluent, or you, don't, you can't even read it fluently. You can't just pick up a Greek New Testament and just start reading it and understand it. And here's what they said. Well, no one can do that. No one's fluent. This is really a peculiar language because every other language in the world has all these people that are fluent. It, like, it's just this impossible to learn language. Yeah, it's impossible to learn it the way you're doing it. Because just like it's impossible to become a basketball player by learning in a classroom. I mean, just let's, let's apply, we could use so many illustrations. Let's think about basketball. What if I'm a basketball professor and I take you in the classroom and I teach you everything about basketball, how to shoot, how to pass, but it's all theory. And somebody walks up to me and says, I don't even think you can play basketball. And I said, well, nobody plays basketball. <laughs> basketball hasn't been played in 2,000 years. You know. So, but I can, I can teach basketball and you can learn basketball and tell other people how to, and you can go teach other people how to play basketball, but we're never going to play it. We're never going to go out and actually dribble the ball, shoot the ball, have a game, play it. And then somebody points out, well, what's the NBA doing then? Oh, that's a totally different game. <laughs> right? This is, the, the, folks, this is what they're doing. It's absurd. We could use any illustration. Let, or, or let's say, let's say uh, uh, boxing. You know, I, I'm in, we're in the classroom, or, or let's say mixed martial arts, right? That's the thing these days, right? MMA. So let's say we're talking MMA, and I'm an MMA professor. You know, I, I'm going to teach you all about Muay Thai and Jiu-Jitsu and, and uh, kickboxing, and we're going to learn about Greco-Roman wrestling and karate, and, you know, we're learning all these different things, and, and we're learning all this stuff. But then somebody says, well, have you ever even been in a fight? No, nobody, nobody does that. Yeah. That's not my goal. 
My goal is just to dance around on stage and, and do katas, you know, and be like, whoa, you know, show, just to demonstrate the moves. Yeah, but have you ever actually used these things on the street? Do they even work? Well, no, but, you know, you're missing the whole point. I'm just learning about fighting. And I, well, I'm just learning so I can teach other people how to fight. But neither I nor them are actually going to ever get in a fight. Wouldn't that be absurd? Wouldn't that be ridiculous? If you never actually got the hands-on, you never actually did it, you never actually used it. And here's the way it is with the Greek. Basically, what they do, they go to Bible college, and they're learning, like, jump kicks, spinning back fist, okay, right? They're, they're learning, you know, some of the most difficult moves. What would be some of the really difficult moves in, in MMA? Somebody help me out. Tornado kick. <laughs> I've never even heard of that. <laughs> The, the, they're learning the 540s and the roundhouse. You know, they're learning all these wild flying kicks, right? They're learning, you know, they're learning uh, the, the Bruce Lee's one-inch punch and everything. You know, they're learning all these things. Okay. But then, basically, you get them in front of a punching bag and say, all right, give, show me a jab and a cross. And they're just like, um, what? You know. They're, they're, and then they just start throwing, like, haymakers at the... <laughs> They start throwing haymakers at the punching bag. They came and demonstrate a jab and a cross. Show me a left hook. Show me the old one, two. That, folks, that's what this test is that this guy gave, these 10 questions, right? He's basically telling them, show me a jab. Show me a right cross. Right? Can you, just, can you basically just show me a boxing stance? Can you just assume the boxing stance? And they're just like, oh, well, this is totally different. We're learning something different. It would be ridiculous in any area of life, any language, any sport, any job. It's ridiculous how these guys can get away with getting up and lying and not knowing anything about the subject that they're supposed to be experts in. And they do a bunch of vain jangling. One of these preachers said, well, he said, right now I'm in Greek 4. He's studying for his doctorate. He's in Greek 4. You have like Greek 1, Greek 2, Greek 3, Greek 4. He's in Greek 4. He said, right now, we're learning about verbal aspect outside of the indicative mood. And we're understanding, you know, why the author chose to use a certain aspect when there's no time indication. And uh, th this isn't in my notes, but he particularly brought up Matthew chapter 19, if you want to turn there. He particularly brought this example up. As an example of, well, here's what we're learning. Here's why we don't need to know how to order a glass of water or read the Bible or go soul winning or anything like that. I mean, if you're over there, you're going to need a glass of water. If you were actually out in the field using the language. So, so uh, let me find it myself. It's in uh, Luke chapter 19. They said, he said, for example, he said, last time I was in class, this is what we talked about. This is a guy who's in Bible college right now, learning Greek, Greek level four. Okay. Verse 16, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And they were learning about that word have there. Turns out, some manuscripts have the word have there present, and some of them have it as aorist. So, you know, what are the implications of that? I mean, is he saying, you know, what good things should I do that I may have eternal life? Or is he saying, like, that I may have <laughs> eternal life? Or is it more like have eternal life? <laughs> Folks, is this a complicated sentence? Is this, I mean, it, how much meaning is packed into that word have? You know, it depends on what you mean by the word is. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Clinton, right? Think about this, folks. Folks, it's not even God talking. It's some bozo who's not saved coming up to Jesus thinking that he has to do works to be saved. It's a work salvation believing bozo. Hey, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Well, what did he mean by have though? All right, let's spend the next hour talking about it. And when we walk out, none of us can read our Bibles in Greek. None of us can speak Greek. None of us can order at a Greek restaurant. None of us can win a soul to Christ in Greek. But we really got to the bottom of that word, have. That's Bible college in a nutshell. And you know what? You ought to be thankful how much money I'm saving you. 
So you don't flush it down the toilet on one of these distance learning online Bible colleges or seminaries. This is the kind of junk you'd be wasting your time on. You know what that's called? Foolish questions. You know what that's called? Vain jangling. You know what that's called? Strifes of words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. It's junk. Now, many, many professions, they have their own little specialized jargon, don't they? Have you ever heard of legalese? Or how doctors will use a lot of jargon. Right. And what it does, it kind of locks you out, doesn't it? Yeah. You're not part of the club. They can kind of talk in their own little jargon. The doctors can talk in their jargon. And, oh, you poor little ignorant fool. You don't know what's going on. You're not initiated. That's how these theologians are. That's how these Bible college seminary guys are. They want to talk about the inceptive aorist all day. They don't even know the language. It's nonsense. If you would flip over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. i got to hurry up and finish here. Did you ever have a guy at your work who knows how to do a certain job, but he won't teach anyone else because he wants to be the only one who can do it so that he has job security or so that he can have that desirable job and make you do the grunt work so he won't train you on the hard stuff because he wants to be the guy who's getting paid? That's how these guys are. They, they, look, folks, they're not trying to help you learn the Bible. They're trying to show you how smart they are and make you feel dumb and lock you out because you don't know their fancy words like homo teleton and hapex legomenon and, you know, all this stuff that they come at you with. You don't know your nomina sacra from your own sacrum. You know, they're, you know, they're just trying to mess with you with all these fancy words. But at the end of the day, what doth it profit? And by the way, that's a question that I ask almost every day of my life. What does it profit? What is it? Every, everything we do in life, shouldn't there be a profit? Shouldn't there it have value and not be vain? Vain jangling? Vain foolish questions? He says in Luke 11, you're turning to John 7, but in Luke 11 he said, Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. You took away the key of knowledge. And folks, if anyone actually wants to learn Greek, if anybody suggested, hey, maybe we should actually learn modern Greek and learn how to talk to Greek people, then we can actually read the Bible. You know what they'll say? Oh, no, that's not going to work. Oh, that won't work. That'll never work. Totally different language. But yet, every teenager that we walked up to in a Greek-speaking country last week and the week before, 15, 16, 17-year-olds we're reading them passages out of the New Testament, and they're understanding them, no problem. The owner of a tattoo shop, he's not exactly a seminary graduate. <laughs> right? I mean, guys out there, pierced up, he's putting tattoos on people for a living, smoking a cigarette as we preach to him, and he's reading the Greek New Testament, no problem. Meanwhile, over here at the Baptist Seminary here in Phoenix, the Baptist Bible College here in Phoenix, and all over America... They can't do what this guy's doing. So if the goal is to actually understand the Greek New Testament, maybe we should do it the way that tattoo guy did it, by actually learning the language, the modern language. What about the, and let, let me just break this down to you. What if somebody wanted to read the King James Bible? Would they have to learn King James English, or could they just learn English? I mean, think about this. Would they have to only be able to use a book, oh, you need a special textbook, that's going to teach you how to speak in these and thous. Would you have to do that to learn how to read a King James? Or here's what you'd tell people. You'd say, well, first learn contemporary English, and then you'll be able to read the King James, and after like a week of reading it, you'll make the adjustments in your brain. You'll figure out the these, the thous, talkest, and goeth, and all that. Is it really that big of a shift from the way we talk to a King James kind of lingo? For all have sinned and, un and come short of the glory of God. I wonder what that means. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Hmm, I wonder what that means. That's a foreign language. No, it isn't. So here, if somebody wanted to learn English, you know what the best way to do it would be? To talk to people in English. Folks, I was in Germany talking to my wife's relatives. I'm talking to these teenagers. They're fluent in English. And I said, how did you guys get so good at English? How did you do it? You know what they told me? 
They said, we put on a headset and we're playing video games with Americans and we're chatting while we play a video game. That's why we're fluent in English. So what the classroom failed to do, chatting accomplished. Because that's how you learn a language. Think about what I'm saying, folks. You have to speak and listen and talk, right? And look, things like Duolingo are great. Rosetta Stone's great. Pimsleur's great. I mean, those kind of programs work great. Way better than Bible college. A hundred times better than Bible college. But at the end of the day, you have to get out there and actually do the talking. And the great thing is with today's technology, one of the things that I did to prepare for going over there and doing soul winning and, and speaking Greek over there and practicing, one of the things I did was I spent an hour a day for a week and a half video Skyping with people in Greece. So I went on this website where you could spend like literally seven or eight dollars an hour and just video Skype with native people in Greece. And, and, and I just told them, hey, let's just only talk Greek for the whole hour. And I stumbled and stammered through it. And I did that for like a week and a half. And boom, you know, I'm communicating, I'm talking. I'm doing, and obviously, I'd already done a lot of the study. But eventually, you got to get out on the court and start dribbling the ball, don't you? Right. Eventually, you got to put on the gloves and get in the ring and do the fighting. It can't all just be theory, right? Eventually, you got to jump in the water and start swimming. You can't just, you know, everybody, okay, everybody go like this. You know, we're going to learn how to swim, all right? You got to actually get in the water. So, John chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? How does this guy know the Bible? He didn't go to our Bible college. He didn't go to our seminary. What do they mean, having never learned? You think Jesus never learned? They're talking about Jesus. Jesus getting up and preaching, and he's preaching such a powerful sermon that a little later they say, never man spake like this man. They were astonished at Jesus' doctrine. They were astonished at his preaching. They were blown away by the power of the message. Well, yeah, but where's his degree? How does this man know letters? I mean, we didn't teach him the alphabet. Folks, you don't have to go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees to learn the alphabet. You can learn on your own. Jesus knew the Bible. Of course he learned. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So look, who are we trying to glorify? The Lord not ourselves, okay? Tell that to these guys in Bible college that just want to brag about something that they don't even know that they can't even use. Now, let me just give you the third reason and then we'll move on to the final conclusion. Go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So, three reasons for this fraud. What's the motive? Number one, it's to hide the fact that they don't actually know Greek. Number two, it's to make you think that Greek is a special language so they can pull out hidden esoteric meanings and then you feel like, well, I got to listen to this guy to figure out what the Bible really says. And then number three reason why this fraud exists is so that they can teach false doctrine that directly contradicts what the Bible says in English. And they'll say, yeah, but in Greek, it says something different. Who's ever heard somebody directly contradict what the Bible says in plain English and say, well, no, if you go to the Greek, it says something totally different. Folks, I've heard it my whole life. This has bothered me for a long time. I'm, I'm glad that I was finally able you know, to, to, to put this thing to rest. And, I, you know, I'm putting together a documentary about the trip that we took because we filmed a lot of our conversations with young people and soul winning and things that we did over there and just put this thing to bed and show everybody, hey, listen, the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> and it's shocking that someone hasn't already pointed this out. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing. I mean, there are some people that are doing it, but most people haven't heard these things. Coming after you, Greek professors, seminary guys, preachers going back to the Greek, we're going to shut you down. Yeah. And you know what? You guys could probably spend like a couple weeks on Duolingo and shut these bozos down with just like a few weeks on Duolingo because it it's not that hard. 
Here's the conclusion, though. So the, th the third reason, which I don't really have time to go into, is just to teach doctrine that just directly contradicts what the Bible says. Yeah, but in Greek, that's, you know, it's different. All three of these are wicked reasons. Okay. Here's the conclusion of the matter. There's no point in reading the Word of God if you're not going to use it. There is no point in studying, reading, learning the Word of God if you're not going to use it. If it's just all going into a black hole in your brain and never being used, then what is the point? There is no point. And there's no point in, using, in learning Greek unless you're actually going to use it to serve God. Unless you're actually going to use it to produce some kind of work for the Lord or, or some kind of profitability in the real world. Not just look at me, everybody. And you know what? These guys, they love to debate, don't they? These, these Greek guys and these scholars. You know, one of these bozos is in town here. I'm not going to name his name, but it starts with a J. And it ends in Ames White, okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, pardon my French, but you know what these debates are? A pissing match. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a biblical word, by the way, so you can't get mad at me for saying that. Hey, everybody, look at me. You know what it reminds me of? A bodybuilding competition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're just out there just... <laughs> you know, they're just, just, they're putting on display. It's like an intellectual bodybuilding competition. You know, body, I'm sorry, no offense to anybody who's into it. Bodybuilding's a dumb sport. Yeah. There, I said it. Yeah. It's a beauty pageant for dudes. <laughs> And, and, and everybody's, everybody's juiced. Everybody's on roids or human growth hormone or hormone replacement therapy or whatever. Everybody's using. And these guys, they, they get so much muscle, it, it starts looking stupid after a while. You know, they're like the opposite of an anorexic person. You know, like an anorexic person, they're, they're super skinny, but they look in the mirror and they're like, oh, I'm still kind of fat. Right? They think they need to lose weight. These guys are just like... And they're like, I need to gain more weight. I need to get more muscle. This, this bicep's tiny. It's just like a coconut. Right? And eventually, it starts looking stupid eventually. Like their head is too small for their body. But to them, it looks cool. It's a stupid sport, friend. Now, look, if, if you actually wanted to be into weightlifting, you know what the goal should be with weightlifting? Like actually lifting something. You know, that's why I think powerlifting is a better sport than bodybuilding. Because at least then you're actually competing in, like, how much weight can you lift, not just look at me, everybody. But even if you're just powerlifting so you can lift a barbell in a gym, does that really have any internal value? Nope. Now, if I were to lift weights, it would be so I could get in shape so I could serve God better. Amen. Or so that I could go to my job. Let's say I have a job where I'm loading stuff, and if I hit the gym and get strong, then I could do better at my job. Right? Or, you know, I mean, those are legitimate reasons. Be healthy. I mean, look, when we went soul winning, you know, I, was, I had this step counter on me the whole time I was out in, um, uh, in Cyprus the last couple of weeks. We were going like 18,000 steps a day over there on average. Okay, so it's like, you know, that, it, you, gotta be, you gotta be able to do that, you know? So it's, it's good to have some basic level. And I'm not, I'm totally out of shape. But it's good to have some level of fitness where at least you can do the walking required for soul winning. Yeah. And by the way, if you go soul winning and your feet hurt, you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. The Bible associates your feet with soul winning. And so, you know, whatever we do should have profit, not just, hey, let's have a debate so we can look smart for everybody. You know what? I'm not interested in debate. I'm interested in getting people saved, raising my family, edifying the church, teaching doctrine. So there's no point in reading the Word of God unless you're going to use it, not just to show how smart you are. There's no point in learning Greek unless you're going to actually use it to serve God. Look down at your Bible. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. It says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Watch this. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So if you don't love people and want to use your knowledge to help other people, you are wasting your time. Go to chapter 13. Knowledge puffeth up, 
but charity edifies. If you just gain a bunch of knowledge, study, and you get the bachelor degree, the master's degree, the PhD, folks, that's just puffing yourself up with that stuff. And then you get up and debate people and show, you know, you're showing off your intellectual muscles. Look what the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, which, by the way, is exactly what he said in 1 Corinthians 14. If you use words that people don't understand, and if you uh, speak in an unknown language, you're like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He explained that same concept. Look at verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, watch this, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. I mean, you know the Bible like the back of your hand. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. You're a great big nothing. I don't care how much knowledge you have. I don't care how much wisdom you have. I don't care how much education you have, how many degrees you have, how many languages you speak. If you don't love people, if you don't love God and love the lost and actually have a religion that goes out and visits the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, that keeps yourself unspotted from the world, that preaches the gospel to every creature, that fulfills the Great Commission, you are nothing. Amen. You're nobody. Oh, this guy's a great scholar. He's nothing. Yeah. Amen. How many people did he win to Christ in the last 12 months? If the number is zero, then he's not following Christ because he's not a fisher of men. Oh, I got all this knowledge. Well, you know what? I'd rather have somebody who has a little less knowledge, but they're actually using the knowledge that they have. Amen. And by the way, these guys that have all the knowledge, they don't know as much as you think, as I demonstrated earlier in the sermon. So why, why have I learned Greek? I learned Greek, number one, so that I could do my personal devotions in Greek, so that I can read my Bible every day in Greek. Number two, so I could go out soul winning to Greek people and win them to Christ. Number three, so I could defend the King James Bible, which is the tool that God is using in 2019. It is the soul winning tool. Amen. And obviously other languages, you know, they've got their Spanish Bible. I'm talking about in the English speaking world, which is a huge world, by the way. Yeah. Folks, this is what actually makes sense. Okay. And so the purpose of this sermon is to explain to you that knowledge puffeth up, charity edifies. Folks, it's all, about, it's all about using the Word of God. You know, I hope you read your Bible every single day. But I hope even more that you use the Bible. That you'd be a soul winner. And listen, don't you ever doubt, and, and part of the reason why I'm preaching this as well is because I don't want you to doubt your King James Bible. I don't want you to think like, oh, well, maybe there's something to this Greek and Hebrew stuff, and maybe, maybe, maybe what we have isn't enough. It is, folks. How can you listen to these people when they don't even know cat, dog, hello, bye, the number nine, they can't even count to ten. Would you trust a Greek professor that can't count to ten? Because the vast majority of those 30 men in that, in that conference that were all Greek teachers and doctorate students could not count to ten in Greek. Is that who you're going to trust to tell you that the King James has problems? Oh, well, scholars agree that the King James is inaccurate. That's who you're listening to, folks. Is that who you're going to trust? Or are you going to trust the English Bible that's been used by God more than any other book in the history of mankind? Yeah. This is the greatest translation in the history of mankind in any language. Yeah. The King James Bible. You can t that, this thing is like a rock. And you know what? All the atheists, agnostics, and scholarship, and bozos have been hammering at this thing, and all their hammers just break. And here we are, 408 years later, and this thing is like a rock. Amen. It's still the number one Bible that people actually read. This is what you need. You need to read this and use this and hang all this ridiculous scholarship and academia, the Bible colleges and the seminaries. Hang all that. Save your money on the distance learning, getting your seminary degree over the internet. You don't need to send in your box tops and get your master of theology degree. You know what? Why don't you get a master's degree in soul winning? Why, right? Why don't you get a bachelor of actually doing stuff? It's ridiculous. Let's borrow a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord God. Help us to use it and not, not, not let it just be a theory unto us, Lord. 
And when we hear preaching, help us to put it into practice. If we hear a child-rearing sermon, Lord, help us to put that into practice and use that. If we hear a sermon on marriage, help us to use that. If we hear a, a sermon rebuking sin, help us to get the sin out of our life, Lord. If we hear a sermon about uh, the gospel and the plan of salvation, help us to go and use that to give someone the gospel and get someone saved, Lord. Help us to redeem the time and be busy out in the harvest doing your work instead of grandstanding and showing off and debating and, and, and trying to be some kind of a self-proclaimed expert, Lord. Help us to get out there and do the work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.